like so many others of you, my first introduction to photography was with the Soviet Zenit E. I remember buying it at a local fete in 1996 for five quid, mounted with the standard Helios 58mm f2 lens. It was a great little camera from memory. Unbelievably, I still have some photos I took with it when I was about 14 years old. Don't laugh, we were going through a bit of a James Bond phase at the time. Whilst my interest in photography, and in cameras in particular, has blossomed since then, I still look back with nothing but fond memories of that old Zenit E, the camera that started it all. I can't remember exactly what happened to that little camera. It was probably replaced with something with a few more bells and whistles, and likely met its demise at the local tip. Luckily I don't need to feel too guilty, as although it cost £5 in 1996, it's realistically only worth about 15 quid today. Remarkable considering the explosion of vintage camera prices in the last few years. As with almost all Soviet cameras, the reason for these low prices is not poor design or reliability. These things were built like tanks after all. No, the only real reason is that the Soviets produced gazillions of them over the years, resulting in an oversaturation on the used market. Despite being an entry-level consumer-grade camera, the Zenit E has everything most people need to produce excellent images. It has a 5-speed shutter, with speeds of 1 500th, 1 250th, 1 125th, 1 60th, 1 30th and bulb. It has an uncoupled selenium meter for judging exposure times, good for film speeds from ASA 16 right up to 500. It has a flash sync, a self-timer, and as mentioned before, that really rather excellent Helios 58mm f2 lens that was based on Zeiss's own Biotar 2. Whilst the camera was clunky and kind of heavy, it was simple and reliable, and most importantly cheap. No wonder it was such a success, and so many were made. As time's gone on, I've moved away from SLRs in general. I'm rather lazy, and the thought of having to trudge around with heavy unwieldy gear really doesn't appeal to me anymore. I much prefer the form factor of vintage rangefinder and viewfinder cameras. Yet the nostalgic memories of my time with that Zenity have stuck with me, and though I've considered buying another one, I quickly remember why I moved away from SLRs in the first place. That was until something really quite spectacular came my way. For this is no ordinary Zenit E. This is a Zenit ES. It is identical to the E in every way, with one exception. It has a second shutter release in the base plate of the camera. That shutter release is there so that the camera can be mounted to this huge 300mm f4.5 tear 3 lens and be triggered using this frightening looking rifle stock. This package is known as the Photo Sniper FS3. The Photo Sniper was originally used by the KGB but was made available to the public as a kit in the 1960s. The kit comprised of the Zenit ES, the 300mm tear 3 lens, the rifle stock, a Helios lens, a selection of coloured filters, a hood, straps, caps, tools, film cassettes for loading bulk film, all of this in this lovely steel case that doubles as a rucksack when fitted with the supplied straps. This example is particularly gorgeous. Absolutely everything is there, and in remarkably mint condition, looking every inch the way it did when it was first purchased in 1968. Interestingly, it came with its original purchase receipts from an out of camera shop, just a stone's throw away from me, costing a mere £125 new, ironically the exact same price I paid for it in 2022. Talk about from one extreme to another. This setup couldn't be further away from the sort of cameras I normally shoot. Its lens is enormous and stupidly heavy. The camera lens and rifle stock coming in at a whopping 2.9 kilos. If you want to wear the backpack with all the other included gear, add another 3.5 kilos to the party. That's pretty insane when you compare it to my trusty pocketable Leica 3 at just 670 grams with lens. I'm almost exclusively a nifty 50 shooter, but do occasionally stray into the 70mm territory. Anything longer on a rangefinder just feels ridiculous, making the camera too front heavy and very difficult to accurately focus. So as well as satisfying my nostalgic desire to own a Zenit E, the photo sniper also provides me with a new option to get some serious reach into my photography, something that I've never had in my arsenal before, Arsenal being a rather appropriate word, with this thing looking more like it belongs in a weapons crate than it does in a camera bag. So how to test this thing? Well, rather fortunately, it was my youngest daughter's fourth birthday a few days ago. The family planning a nice jaunt down to a local zoo to celebrate. What better way to put the photo sniper through its paces? I must admit the night before I ended up losing a bit of sleep thinking about the logistics of how this might work. Not only was there concern about the weight and the unwieldiness, but I had also read online that other photo sniper users had run into problems with Joe Public because of the gun-like appearance of the outfit. There was nowhere I was going to take all the extra equipment or the backpack as the weight of the camera alone was already enough to worry me. The strap on the stock is of a decent quality, but a little thin, so I attached the padded shoulder strap from my Billingham bag to hopefully prevent it from garroting me. We arrived at the zoo and I was generally crapping myself when I passed through the ticket kiosk, but in the end, nobody batted an eyelid. In fact, my concern was totally unfounded. Whilst the camera got a lot of attention during the day, it was all very positive, 
with people commenting on the unusual quirkiness of the setup, without collaring me for attempting to assassinate a meerkat. To begin with, I didn't know how to deal with the sheer bulk of the photo sniper. I was assuming I'd sling it over my shoulder when not shooting, and reach for it when I was. However, even with the strap fully extended, there wasn't enough slack to shoulder mount it and hold it to the eye when ready to shoot. The stock also ended up waving around behind me, which presented both a risk of damaging the camera and, more importantly, blinding some unsuspecting child who might run into it. In the end, the most comfortable solution was to hang it around the neck and support it with both arms in front of the body when not in use. That way, there was still just enough slack in the strap to bring it to my eye when ready. It wasn't too unwieldy, kept the stock in check so no one got hurt and ended up looking and feeling a lot like I was on a UN peacekeeping mission in Kosovo. I must admit, that 300mm field of view took some getting used to. Whilst it was perfect for shooting smaller mid-range subjects, it felt way too cramped for shooting the larger animals, even at some considerable distance. I also tried to grab a few more shots of the family, but found it to be pretty much impossible. You have to stand miles away and communicate with hand signals and shouting, not exactly low-key. So for wider subjects, you'll need to find another solution, the obvious answer being the supplied Helios 50mm. Genuinely, the thought of carrying any more weight would be daunting to me, even if it was just that Helios or another small rangefinder. You've got the added weight, but also the risk of both cameras bashing together. About the only appealing solution I can think of would be another SLR, specifically the Pentax Auto 110, the smallest SLR I ever made. Not only is it genuinely pocketable, but it also only weighs 150 grams, almost half the weight of the Helios. OK, you'd be shooting 110 film, which won't necessarily be everyone's bag, but for me it would be more than ample for the occasional family snap when not using the telephoto. If you've ever played the Call of Duty games, you'll know the sniper always carries a pistol in his loadout, just in case some crafty kid sneaks up on him. In the same vein, the Pentax Auto 110 seems like a fitting quick-draw pistol partner to the photo sniper. Apart from the weight, the FS3 was generally a nice experience to shoot with. The focusing is achieved by turning a horizontally placed dial under the lens. It's intuitive, allowing easy operation while offering support for the lens barrel. It can be slightly difficult to judge correct focus when shooting wide open, but I suspect that is something that becomes easy with use. There's a nice reassuring clack when you fire the trigger, as both the shutter and aperture blades fire. There is also something intangibly enjoyable about cocking the shutter and charging the aperture blades after each shot, again feeling more like you're loading a rifle than you are shooting a camera. There are a couple of quirks. Whilst the Zenit ES possesses a built-in uncoupled selenium light meter, it's pretty difficult to read when the camera is hanging from the strap. Also, as it's not a through-the-lens metering system, it seems unlikely the reading will be centre-weighted enough to accurately measure what you're seeing through the lens. That said, it seemed to perform more than well enough on the day. Also, it's easy enough to shoot the photo sniper in landscape, but if you twist the setup 90 degrees to shoot in portrait, the whole thing becomes unstable and unmanageable handheld. I guess in this scenario, and also in the scenario where you intend to carry the rucksack case with all the other goodies, you're really going to want to mount it on a tripod. But to me that seems pretty counterintuitive, given the whole purpose of this outfit is to aid handheld telephoto shooting. Whilst I'm no expert in telephoto lenses, I can say that I'm happy with the rendering of the Tear 3. It certainly seems to be very sharp across all apertures, with excellent soft creamy bokeh shot wide open. To me it possesses a surprisingly modern contrasty look, despite being well over 50 years old. I did screw up slightly. You'll notice a band down the side of some of the images. A slightly sticky shutter was the culprit, a result of the camera clearly never being used. Luckily this was very easily fixed by tightening the curtain spring. That's one of the great things about these Soviet cameras. Most issues can be easily fixed with really very little technical know-how. Although it seems like an odd time to be promoting a Russian camera, particularly given what's going on in the world at the moment, I really enjoyed my first experience with the Photo Sniper FS3. It's certainly been one of the funnest cameras to review, partly because of the nostalgia of shooting with my childhood camera, partly because of the attention-grabbing nature of that huge lens and gun stock, and partly because of the challenge of shooting with such a long lens. Uncharted territory for me. Just how much use it will get is another question, but I'm so pleased to have it in my collection. However, if you're thinking about pulling the trigger on one of these yourself, pun very much intended, just remember, it's been three days since I shot with it at the zoo, and my neck is still killing me.